Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church, Vancouver. We're so glad that you can join us today as we worship God together through our online live stream service. Today, we look forward to celebrating the Lord's Supper together. We remember that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave his all for us, even giving his life upon a cross. And we celebrate that he is risen and that in him, we can have true and eternal life. The Bible says about Jesus that in him was life and the life was the light of all people. All good things are found in him. So we celebrate that he is our life. He is our purpose. He is our treasure. He is our all in all. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we gather together in your name this morning, wherever we are, and we thank you that we have true fellowship in your spirit. We thank you, Jesus, the Son, for giving your life, your all on the cross. We praise you, Father, for raising him from the dead. We thank you, triune God, for loving us, for saving us, for redeeming us, for giving us life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We invite you, as you are able, wherever you are, to join us in a song of praise. So I invite Maria Forrester to come and lead us in the song, You Are My All in All. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is none like you. You are glorious, mighty, gracious, and loving. 
you alone are worthy of worship. Before you and only you do we bow in adoration. You are our all in all, O Lord Jesus Christ. And in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome. It is so good to worship together. May the blessings and presence of our Lord cause your heart to soar and your voice to rise in praise. And may you know the presence of God with you this morning. If you're joining us for the first time, I especially want to welcome you. My name is Callum, and I have the privilege of serving a senior pastor at Trinity Baptist Church. From Thursday to Friday last week, several of our youth and youth leaders took part in a 30-hour famine to raise money and awareness for millions of children around the world who go hungry. Our youth and their leaders slept outdoors as a way to identify with many homeless people in our city. As we'll discover in our message today, the Lord uses young people to teach the rest of us what living for Jesus really means. So I want to thank our youth and their leaders for their example. All of us have been shocked and saddened by the terrifying COVID situation in India. We have sisters and brothers in our congregation with family and friends in India. And as a church, we support a pastor, Pastor Mahesh, working among some of the poorest in India. Between Saturday, May 15th, and Saturday, May 22nd, the pastors are calling all of us to pray for India and for many in our world suffering because of the pandemic. We're calling this prayer initiative Seven at Seven for Seven. Let's pray for seven minutes at seven o'clock in the evening for seven days. Pastor Lee will post daily prayer guides online, or they will be sent by email. We also invite you to join our hour of prayer on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on May 15th and on May 22nd to focus all of us in prayer. The hour of prayer is available in English and Mandarin. Login details are in our bulletin. So please join us for seven at seven for seven and the hour of prayer. Thank you. Thank you too for your faithful support for Trinity with your prayers and encouragement and giving. Your generosity displays the faithfulness of God. Please call the church office or visit our website and click on give to find out more. And may the Lord continue to bless you. Thank you. I'll pass over to Pastor Alvin now. Well, hello everyone, and especially to our boys and girls watching. But for our children's moment this morning, I want to show you another piece of my artwork. A couple of weeks ago, I showed you, uh, was it, what was it, an oil pastel? But I also did pencil sketches growing up. And this did not make the art gallery, but this is special to me. And maybe you can, you can see this if you put it in your main view. So this picture is a picture of my wife and a number of pictures of, of me and her. And actually in a, just a few short days, it is our 20th wedding anniversary. Now I know that some of you watching are celebrating 30, 40, or praise God, even 50 or 60 years of marriage. But this picture is a picture of Sarah who's in the middle with a beautiful South Asian uh, dress. And this is during one of her graduations. 
And I have a sunset going on here. As you can see, I put a haiku poem and there's me on the bottom on one of my graduations. And wow, it's amazing, 20 years. And pra praise God for those of you who are, who are continuing on in, in, in your marriages. I actually dated Sarah for over five years. So if I put the math together, then I've known her for over half my life, which is a great thing. And you know what? God knows us into our, 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 our goings and, and our comings. And he knows us when we're sad, when we're angry, and he loves us so very much. God knows us intimately. And God even knew us before we were born. Isn't that amazing? And God continues to, to love us so very much. And may we know that God not only knows us today, but he loves us. So right now, let's pray and give thanks to God. Dear Lord, we thank you that you know us so well. And you want to speak to our sadness. You want to speak to our anger. And you love us with an unconditional love. And I pray for each one who is watching, especially the boys and girls, that they may know you more intimately through your word, through your prayer, and as, it, as they go on in their days. I thank you for each one watching, especially the kids. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite, they must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. They must not drink grape juice or eat grapes or raisins. As long as they remain under their Nazarite vow, they must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine not even the seeds or skins. During the entire period of their Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. Throughout the period of their dedication to the Lord, the Nazarite must not go near a dead body, even if their own father or mother or brother or sister dies, they must not make themselves ceremonially unclean on account of them, because the symbol of their dedication to God is on their head. Throughout the period of their dedication, they are consecrated to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For much of last year, many of us had to cope with considerable grief and inconvenience. The grief has been great. The inconvenience is perhaps less so. One inconvenience was not being able to have your hair cut. My daughter was especially frustrated. She has lovely hair, but it requires professional care when it needs to be cut. Every Monday, I take a razor and shave my head. I've done this for months and months, and being bald has its advantages. As it's been said, if you have a beautiful head, why hide it? Or as someone else said, you don't put a marble top 
on bad furniture. And, well, if you choose to use your hormones to grow hair, that's your problem. But as I say the word hair, apart from laughing at my evident lack of such, what stories in the Bible come to mind? Maybe the woman in Luke chapter 7, verse 38, who let down her hair to wipe Jesus' feet. Or maybe you think of King David's son, Absalom, who in 2 Samuel 14, verse 26, only cut his hair once a year when it became too heavy, and who died when riding his mule and his hair got stuck in a bush. The mule carried on, he was left dangling, and Joab, a commander in David's army, plunged a spear into him. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 18. You might even think of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 to 24. Now, he was bald, and members of, of a local youth group jeered at him, calling him baldy. And it didn't end well for 42 of the boys in the youth group. But my guess is the person everyone thinks of is Samson in Judges 13 to 16. The man who was given great strength by God because he never cut his hair. The man who lost his strength because he allowed Delilah, a woman of questionable repute, to trick him into telling her his secret of his strength, and then betraying him to Israel's enemies, the Philistines. From birth, Samson was called to live a devoted life to God, but sadly, he didn't take this call seriously. It was only in his final moments, as he stood in the pagal temple of the Philistines, having been blinded by the Philistines, but now with his hair grown back, that he really understood what devotion to God means. And he gave his life in sacrifice and defeated God's enemies. You see, Samson was called to be a Nazarite. Not to be confused with Nazareth, the village Jesus grew up centuries later. A Nazarite was a person devoted to God. And in Judges 13, an angel of the Lord appears to a woman who was unable to have children. And the angel told her she would give birth to a son, Samson, whose head is never to be touched by a razor. Because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. Judges 13, verse 5. We're looking at the book of Numbers, the biblical record of the wilderness wanderings of the people of Israel between leaving Egypt and entering the promised land. Numbers is God's word for us as we look forward to a promised land how we live for Jesus after COVID. And today's message is about being devoted to God. Number six describes what it means to be a Nazarite. Number six describes what it means to be fully devoted to God. So what did it mean to be a Nazarite? Well, here are six characteristics, and then I'll briefly focus on just two. As you hear these six, think about how you live for Jesus. Are these six characteristics of the Nazarite found in your and my life? First, becoming a Nazarite was a personal choice. In number six, verse two, the Lord says, if a man or woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of separation to the Lord as a Nazarite. God gave the opportunity for anyone, male or female, to full devotion. Have we made the decision to follow God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? 
Second, becoming a Nazarite was a public commitment. Nowhere in number six is the Nazarite told to live apart from people. Yet they drink no alcohol, as number six, verse three says. And this would include at major Jewish festivals or family celebrations. Number six, verse seven says Nazarites were not even allowed to attend a family member's funeral. And of course, they do not cut their hair. Number six, verse five says, during the entire period of their Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. It would not take long before a Nazarite's lifestyle would become public. Is our Christian commitment public? Or do we just keep it private just for Sundays? Third, a Nazarite must follow a special command. What I mean is that they choose a life even more demanding than that of the Levitical priests. Leviticus 10 verse 9 says that priests must abstain from alcohol whenever they entered the tent of meeting. Lazarites had to abstain throughout the period of their vow. Leviticus 21 verse 2 says a priest must not become ceremonially impure by going near a dead body, but the Levite could go near the dead body of a close relative. A Nazarite couldn't attend the funeral even of an immediate family member. The call to purity for the Nazarite was total. Do we mentally catalog our discipleship? Oh, this behavior is more important than that behavior. Or are we devoted to God in one part of our lives, but not in another? Hebrews 12 verse 1 commands us to Put off everything that hinders. And fourth, Nazarites committed themselves to a provisional condition. It wasn't permanent. Their period of devotion would come to an end, as number six, verse 13 tells us. But this doesn't mean their vow was half-hearted. There's a story in Jewish tradition about Helena a non-Jewish queen in the first century AD who converted to Judaism. And she took a Nazarite vow for seven years. That's remarkable in itself. But just before she completed the seven years, she came into contact with a dead body. Number six, verses 11 and 12 says that if this happens, a Nazarite must rededicate themselves to the Lord for the same period of dedication. This is exactly what Queen Helena did. Her Nazarite vow lasted 14 years. The Nazarite vow was a provisional condition, not a permanent one, but it was taken very seriously. How seriously, how serious are we about our call to holiness? Fifth, Nazarites were a powerful challenge to Israel's half-hearted devotion. Jeremiah 7 verses 28 and 29 say, This is the nation that has not obeyed the Lord its God or responded to correction. Truth has perished. It has vanished from her lips. Cut off your hair and throw it away. Take up a lament on the barren heights, for the Lord has rejected and abandoned this generation that is under his wrath. Jeremiah reminds the people of the Nazarite vow not to cut hair, but then turns it around. He's saying that the people lived as though they were fully devoted to the Lord, but they were not. So don't pretend to be what you are not. That's what he's saying. Cut your hair, he tells the Israelites. End this charade of Nazarite devotion. And also look at Amos chapter 2, verse 11. 
Here's another word of judgment, this time upon the kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC. The Lord says he showed the people how to live in devotion to him by raising up Nazarites from among your youths. Here's that word for our young people. Continue to live for Jesus because your devotion to Jesus shows us who are older and sometimes complacent in our discipleship what true devotion means. The Nazarites were a powerful challenge to half-hearted devotion. Do people look at us and say, oh, you're just pretending to be a Christian. You say the right words, even do some of the right things. But underneath, you're no different from anyone else. We need one another to be devoted to the Lord and therefore to challenge any hypocrisy in us. Finally, being a Nazarite involves precious cost. When an Israelite presented an offering, pigeons could be substituted. Pigeons were a cheap alternative. Just look at Leviticus chapter 1, verses 14 to 17, or chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. But this is not adequate for the Nazarite. At the end of the Nazarite's vow, number 6, verses 14 to 15, says the Nazarite must offer two lambs, one ram, grain, a basket of the finest bread, and a drink offering. These are not cheap. These are a costly sacrifice. What's more, at the end of the Nazarite's, at the end of the Nazarite's hair, his hair is shaved and burned as, as part of the offering. All symbols of devotion, therefore, are turned back to God in sacrifice. This says that the Nazarite's devotion is precious to God and costly to the Nazarite. There is cost to our discipleship. But be encouraged. Our discipleship is precious in the eyes of the Lord. Now, we're not called to grow out our hair, to not cut it, or abstain from foods and all drinks, or never attend a family funeral. But does this mean that we don't need to echo the devotion of the Nazarites? No. Here are the two points I want to say more about. First, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 21 and 22, someone says to Jesus that they are ready to follow him, but with a condition. Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus replies, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. That seems such a bizarre and uncaring comment by Jesus. Until we remember the Nazarite vow not to attend even the funeral of your family. Jesus is saying to this would-be disciple and to you and me, are you a disciple in name only or truly committed to me? Remember Queen Helena? She wasn't even Jewish, but chose to accept Judaism. And as a queen, when she neared the end of her seven-year Nazarite vow and then accounted a dead body, I'm sure she could have said, look, I've done seven years as a Nazarite. Am I going to do another seven just because of a dead body? That's ridiculous. But she did another seven years. Just over a week ago, we bought a new washer-dryer for our apartment. At last, we could have clean clothes when, when we were at the apartment. And I loaded up the washer, put in the washing liquid, selected the wash cycle, and pressed start. All went well until it came to the rinse cycle. Nothing happened. A brand new washer-dryer that washed but didn't rinse. And now I was left with a machine that didn't work and full of water. At a time when I'm grieving over my mom's death, this felt like the last straw. Now, thankfully, I didn't kick the dog. 
I didn't scream at the kids. I didn't pound the wall with my fists. But I admit, when things that should work don't work, I sometimes get frustrated. And then I thought of Queen Helena. After seven years of dedication and self-sacrifice, she expected to return to normal life. But it goes wrong in the final weeks. She comes into contact with a dead body. And tradition says that she didn't give up or get frustrated. So should I, when a washer and dryer doesn't work, when schedules are interrupted, when a company's return department doesn't appear to care? This has been the Nazarite challenge on my life this week. But what about you? What is the Nazarite challenge upon your life? Where is God calling you to live a fully devoted life today? And here's the second point. In Acts 18, verse 18, there's another unusual comment. The Apostle Paul has been in Corinth for some time. He's about to sail to Syria. Before he does, the verse says, he had his hair cut off at Sencrea because of a vow he had taken. So what's going on? Well, Paul has his hair cut because he's just finished a Nazarite vow. Obviously, this means that he's allowed his hair to grow long for some time. Now, most men in the ancient world had short hair. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 14 says that long hair brought shame on a man. So Paul would have stood out. And where would he have stood out? Well, he's been in Corinth. Remember Corinth? One of the most difficult mission fields of Paul's ministry. Remember Paul ar arrived in Corinth in weakness with great fear and trembling? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. His only strength was total trust in Jesus. And it seems that Paul took a Nazarite vow to tame his fear, increase his trust in Jesus, and stand out to the Corinthians. Maybe you are at a key point in your life. Maybe you have uncertainty about the future. Maybe you're not sure what the Lord will do. Maybe you're looking for a way to say, I'm going to stand for Jesus no matter what. It's not that God is calling you to grow your hair long or avoid family events. But is there a way you can signal to yourself, to others, and to the Lord that you're taking a new step of faith and trust? Maybe you abstain from something. Maybe you commit to giving or serving at a new level. Maybe you confess an area of weakness and cry out anew to the Lord for his strength. Maybe you commit to our 7 at 7 for 7 prayer time. Maybe you take a stand for Jesus before family, friends, colleagues, and neighbors. The Nazarite vow was a choice, but by making that choice, the Nazarite signaled to God and to others that the Lord was the priority. So ask the Lord where you need to do the same in your life today. Now, today's message is hard. We like to hear about grace, but sometimes we also need to hear about commitment. But there is grace here. In Matthew 27, verse 48, Jesus is on the cross in agony, dying for your sin and mine, carrying the price of our rebellion against God, suffering in our place. And he cries out, and the soldiers who have just nailed him to the cross quench his thirst, wine, vinegar. Now look at Numbers 6, verse 3. This says that the Nazarite must not drink vinegar made from wine. Does Jesus take the drink or not? Mark 15, verse 23 says he didn't. See, even though he was desperate, even though, as Luke 
23 verse 36 says, the soldiers taunted him as they offered him the wine vinegar. Even though he's in absolute agony at the cross, Jesus became the perfect Nazarite. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross, as Philippians 2 verse 8 declares. At the cross, Jesus demonstrates total devotion to his heavenly father. Because your and my salvation matters to him. Total devotion to God is a high calling. Each of us knows that we fall and fail. Samson, a Nazarite from birth, failed over and over. But at the end of his life, he got it right. In the midst of pagan worship, he turned to the Lord and prayed with words he is never recorded having ever said before. Oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. The path to total devotion isn't try better or do more. The path to total devotion is very simple. It's getting our gaze in the right direction. It's saying, oh, sovereign Lord, remember me. Today is May the 2nd. Exactly 514 years ago, a young church monk conducted his first communion service. His name, Martin Luther. The man who 10 years later would nail his famous 95 theses to a church door. And so begin what we call the Reformation. But on that May the 2nd, 1507, Martin Luther didn't know Jesus. He had to lead communion, but he didn't know Jesus. And do you know what happened? He was so scared of the bread and the cup, of what they symbolize as the body and blood of Jesus, that he almost dropped the cup. And when the service was over, he ran as fast as he, as he could away from the communion table. Now, he was right to realize that God is so holy and that he, Martin Luther, was sinful. But he was so wrong to run away and not understand that it is only by God's grace on the cross that we are transformed. We're declared to be holy in God's sight. And then having received Jesus as Lord, have the prompting of God's Holy Spirit within us, calling us to live holy lives full devotion. Jesus is the perfect Nazarite. And with our gaze upon him, we don't run away from God's holiness. We run into God's arms. Come, the Lord says, I love you and I will make you holy. A woman or man of full devotion. Amen. The Bible tells us that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus invited his disciples to share a meal. A meal called the Passover, a Jewish festival to remember God's deliverance of his people from slavery in Egypt centuries before. It was called the Passover because the people were told to prepare a lamb with the blood of the lamb to mark the doorposts and lintel of their homes. And when the angel of the Lord would pass over, those inside would not face God's judgment. As you think about this, notice that God's deliverance has nothing to do with the worthiness of the people in the house. All that mattered was the blood on the doorframe. On the cross, Jesus shed his blood to redeem us. It's not who we are or what we do or where we live or how we feel that matters. All that matters is that we rely upon the blood of Jesus shed for us. At the Passover meal, Jesus took bread and a cup and gave them a deeper meaning. The bread reminds us of his body given for us. The cup reminds us of his blood shed for us. And so we come to this table 
let us come with thankfulness and humility. Let us confess our sins and lean upon the grace of the Lord. Let us know the presence of the Lord and the fresh anointing of the Spirit. Let's take a moment in quiet. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body. Pauline, one of our board members, will lead us in a prayer of thanks for the bread. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, when the crowd asked your son Jesus for a miracle, they asked, what will you do for us? Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do what I want, Lord, you know how much Jesus was despised and rejected. We want to remember how, how <clears throat> you carried our weaknesses. On the cross, he was loaded down with the heavy weight of our sorrows. His body was wounded and crushed for all of our sins. He was innocent, but he was oppressed so that we might have peace. Because he gave up his life we can live with him forever. Jesus told the crowd to spend their energy seeking eternal life that he could give them. The crowd asked, what does God want us to do? Jesus told them, believe in me, the one he has sent. Lord God, we believe that your son Jesus had a purpose to come to this earth. He died for us so that we can live forever with you. We come to you in faith and trust. Thank you for the cross. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Jesus took bread and broke it, and said, this is my body given for us. We remember the Lord, his body given for us, and we give thanks. Amen. At the end of that last supper, just hours before he was crucified, Jesus offered the cup to his disciples saying, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. And then he promised, 
I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in you in the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 14, verses 24 and 25. Bingo, a member of our new Life Fellowship Committee, will lead us in a prayer of thanks for the cup. It's about him pray. Lord, as we drink this wine, we remember that you are the givers of life. You are forgiveness. You bring deep peace to our souls and your love flow within us. As we pour out this wine, we see your sacrifice Pour out for us. We notice the depth of your goodness and the pain you suffer for us. We dwell upon the intricacy of human life and the price you pay to set humanity free. Yet just as the tombstones roll away to unleash the rising road, your light shines in our hearts now, extinguishing our darkness to release heaven's blessing upon us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. We remember the Lord his blood shed for us, and we give thanks. Amen. Let us continue in prayer as our youth intern leader, James, leads us in prayer. Let us pray. All praise to you, Father in heaven. You light our path and lead us beside quiet waters. You refresh our souls. In the darkness, we fear nothing because we know you are with us. Your rod and staff comfort us. You, Lord, are our shepherd, our refuge and strength. Upon you, we cast our burdens and know that you bear them with us. Lord, Father, please accept the offering of our gifts given with sincere gratitude. For you know that we wish to honor you in all that we do. We remember those who risk their health and safety every day in order to serve others in this time. Lord, please protect, encourage, and strengthen them. Jesus, show us how to love one another. Help us to forgive and let go. Sometimes it can be so difficult. Send your spirit among us to soften our hearts. Help us to witness the truth of the gospel in the way we live our lives every day. We remember our leaders and pray that you bless them with wisdom and energy. Place a hedge around them and their families. We pray for the people of India in this most turbulent time. Thank you, Triune God, because no matter what happens to trial and tribulation, we remain confident that you will give us the courage 
to remain steadfast in our obedience to you as our sovereign Lord and Master. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, James. As we celebrate our risen Lord Jesus, who gave his life, who gave his all on the cross for us, and who is now exalted at the right hand of the Father, let us join together in a powerful modern hymn, Majesty, as Maria comes once again to lead us. As you enter this week, go in the presence of the Lord, who is fulfilling his purposes in you and through you. Go rejoicing. Go with thanks. Go with hope. Go in the peace of Christ that passes all our understanding. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. To those of us staying on Zoom to join a breakout room, 
I'll provide details in a minute. But for everyone who needs to go now, you're welcome to join us for our regular recorded service next week and to connect with us. We would love to hear from you. Above all, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great week. Thank you.